And then when, you know, when Nason comes into play uh, a week after Samuel's death in late 2014, he inherits, you know, that big bubble around him, the ideology and the, and the authority behind him and so on. Well, like less than five years later, he's arrested. And then there's just this other, this other big like colossus that comes crashing down on all of it. And it, it sort of sparks a lot of doubt in people. Hey guys, it's X Morgan with My Spiritual Life, and we've got another video here with AJ from the YouTube channel, The Money Store. So excited, and if you haven't seen our previous videos, AJ grew up in the religion called La Luz del Mundo, which is a cult that started in Mexico, and it's, oh my gosh, there is so much to talk about it that we are doing several videos because it's such a rich topic, and I have thoroughly enjoyed our videos so far because there are so many parallels, and you just see, like, how people's brains work and how they can be persuaded into things. It's absolutely amazing. The focus of this video today is going to be specifically about Nason, the apostle of La Luz del Mundo, and his arrest. He was arrested two years ago, and he's awaiting trial that is supposed to take place at the end of September. So we're going to get more into that and the conspiracies that have come from it. And like, why isn't he using his magic powers to get out of jail? All of that. So AJ, Thank you for being here. If you want to briefly introduce yourself again for anyone who's watching this right off the bat, that would be awesome. Yes, uh, Morgan, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I found out about your channel uh, a few months ago through someone else who was also like, who, through someone who was in the organization, in our organization and was talking about like similarities and how, and like the usefulness of like um, doing content like this uh, on public platforms. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, so my name's AJ, I'm the fourth generation. Uh, on my mother's side to be part of uh, La Luz del Mundo and only like two years ago so I had been mentally out for like uh, many men since like late 2014 and since around 2014 and then only two years ago did I actually did I actually exit and I think that the fact that I still like lingered within and felt like the pressure to stay inside um, uh, speaks to the fact that this organization is not a very vanilla religious group with sort of like vanilla standard like ideas it's a it's very it's very culty and very coercive in uh in a number of ways and, and so yeah today we'll be talking about uh nason joaquin garcia who is the present leader of who's the top-notch dog within the organization and uh the different angles of the of his arrest and the sort of like uh contradictions that that people like me try to call out about how he has handled his arrest and then how yet somehow we still have the difficulties of getting people out of the organization, despite um, the, the, you know, despite all the things that we point out. Right. See, because as an outsider looking in, you would think, okay, you're in this religion that's very much centered around this guy, Nason, right? On um, outsider looking in, you're, you see these people in this religion, Nason, this man of God married, you know, telling people you gotta, you know, you got to be loyal to your spouse, all these things. And then he gets arrested and, and, and arrested for very serious charges of sex and like rape, sex trafficking, all these terrible things. Um, and even like with children, right. And, and just like on the outside looking in, you think how in the hell would anyone still believe in this religion? But it's mm -hmm. just not that simple because your brain has been conditioned your entire life that, the, that there's a reason for everything. And that even if you're questioning, there's a reason, right? And, and like in our previous video, we mentioned some people assume with Nason that it's like, it's a trial of their faith kind of thing. Like he's, he's shaking the rug. Like he's, he's trying to see who's going to fall away and doubt him because he was arrested, even though he's obviously innocent and perfect. Right. And so anyway, it's just, it's so, so incredibly fascinating. So tell us more about yeah. um, Nason being arrested. What, um, what all, you know, he was arrested for and mm -hmm. yeah, we'll go from there. Uh, so yeah, uh, Nason Joaquin Garcia was first arrested on Monday, June 3rd, 2019, and the, the rest of the church didn't learn about it until the afternoon of Tuesday, June 4th, 2019, and so he's been in jail ever since then in LA County. Uh, at first, he had a $25 million bail on him, which was really high, then it, then it amped up to $50 million within like a day or two, you know, somewhere in that week, um, and then... And then uh, later that summer in 2019, it transformed into no 
sorry, mm -hmm. I'll just clarify that the reason why California set such a high bail is when you have someone who is the leader of a huge church like this, um, the, the organization could pull together the funds to bail him out. And mm -hmm. so they have to set just a very, very high bail if they, they don't want him to get out and possibly mm -hmm. do more harm to people. Anyway, so go ahead. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the original set of charges was 26 of them uh, divided between mostly, you know, most of, most of them are his, but they're divided between um, uh, Nason Joaquin Garcia, Asalea Rangel Melendez, who was a woman in like her 30s, 40s, who, uh, who's been close to the Joaquin family and been close to his father, and who's been like a sort of secretary-ish kind of person, um, and who has some sort of like political ties in Mexico, and, and not just that, she's actually never been arrested this whole time. You know, the charges are set out there for her, but she's, uh, she's been on the run ever since then, just not at all seen. She's likely hiding in Jalisco. She's likely hiding in Mexico with some help from the church. Um, so Nason Joaquin Garcia and then Asalea Rangel Melendez, who is the woman on the run. Then there's two other people, Susana Oaxaca, who is, um, who is also a sort of um, uh, secretary of the church. And, but she only has like one or two charges against her and we'll, we'll get into her situation later, but it's not too important. And then the, the, the third and fine, the third, the fourth and final person of this group of four is um, Alondra Ocampo. And Alondra Ocampo is the one who has the most charges on her. And she has a $5 million bail on her, some high, some high bail on her. And she's, as of October, 2020, she's decided to flip on Nason and start to collaborate with the uh, with the, with the prosecutors. So, uh, so, she, so she's actually wanted to collaborate ever since she was arrested, but she waited until October, 2020 to, to announce that. And we waited until then because, uh, uh, because this is very important. So, so hold on, let, let me go into the charges. There's like 26 of them yeah. at, at first originally. Now it's a different number and it's higher, but it's a different number. Um, I don't know that exactly right uh, on hand, but okay. uh, but the charges range from like possession of child pornography, uh, production of it, um, sex trafficking, human trafficking, extortion, uh, rape, um, et cetera. That's, that's the sort of charges that are divided between the four of them. And most of them, of course, are on Nason. And Nason also has this big doctrine around him and the sort of uh, sizable community of believers who uh, who who, who that bail, you know, is set for really, because the, those people could gather a lot of money. The church has a lot of money, but they, they could gather even much more money to, to really get him out. And then of course he would, he would pose a threat to, uh, wherever, wherever he would, he would pose a threat to the community again, you know, probably doing something more to young people. And if not that he, uh, the, the bill was also set and the prosecutors did it this way because they, they wanted to, um, keep Nason from, from leaving the country. Um, there are some members in Cuba and there are members in maybe like another place or two where uh, there are no extradition laws in place. And so the United States could like lose track of, you know, Nason. And so that, that's what like the prosecutors are trying to avoid with a gigantic bail like that. Uh, presently, the bail is at $90 million, the, the highest bail ever set in Los Angeles, the literal incarceration capital of the planet. And uh, and and the man and the man who managed to like accomplish that was the man whose portrait I had I didn't put it up there you know my family put it up there but it was like right next to my bedroom uh, wall and it's right next to and it's right in the living room when you walk into my house uh, amongst a bunch of other like family pictures as if you know as if he's like part of us uh, that's the dude who landed this thing um, so uh, I've explained the charges yes oh, go ahead. I was just saying the members believe he's innocent right they believe mm -hmm. this is like a trial of their faith and like satan yeah. somehow convinced these witnesses to say things or is that kind of like the consensus or yeah so it, immediately the the sort of chants and the mantras that came from members and that that uh that the spokespeople that the higher ups were putting into members were that no he is innocent he is honorable um he, he it'll be proven in court these are fake this is a this is a this is a conspiracy by someone and if, and, and if it's not a conspiracy it's a hit job by a certain, a certain group of people which you know it's still conspiracy but uh but then you know other theories and we'll get into them later is like uh theories about like the catholic church is really behind us all the church is the, the church is way too big and and we're growing way too much and that's why they're trying to like get our leader in this way um th those are the sort of things that are floating around 
and that I tried to like stamp out and address. Right, right. And so, and just a little bit of background for those who don't know. So the, the members of La Luz del Mundo, they really believe that Nason um, is, is deity. He's not, not like quite human. Like he has magical powers and like he can, you know, possibly even read people's mind and perform miracles, like throwing tornadoes and hurricanes out of the way. And just so there's a lot of this um, stigma around like that he is just incredible and special and amazing. And so, um, and the fact that, you know, you'd think, oh, he could just break himself out of jail, but, oh, but he's not doing that because he wants to see who's really loyal, right? So just giving people a little bit of background that we talked about in the, little, the, the previous mm -hmm. video. So, okay, yeah. so go ahead, tell us more about um, the, so these, the, these you know, like accusations and, and the lawyers and yeah, yeah, go ahead. So uh, uh, in, in the previous video, we talked about how the church has evolved in terms of its attitudes towards its members going to get a degree of higher education. Uh, in early years, it, that basically wasn't allowed. It was seen as a sort of threat to the spirituality of early members in the church. And we have that threat looming there because it it can spoil everything. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, in later decades, uh, certainly by like the late um 80s or 90s for sure you know there's there's a different attitude towards people going to college and whatnot and people start to go to it and but when you go to it you you enter into whatever profession but you know ideally some profession that you can end up using to help the church grow further uh dedicate your dedicate your degree to the apostle decorate your nice uh graduation cap with the apostles logo and whatever it's really weird but um there are a number of lawyers in the church uh definitely and mind you, lawyers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some people just handle like tax stuff. Some people, other people handle criminal stuff. Other people handle copyright laws. You know, the, the, these people come in all sorts of um, prof uh, all sorts of fields. Right. Uh, but there are definitely lawyers within the organization, and there's probably there's probably maybe one or two. I'm not too sure who that could handle criminal charges. Right. And so Nasson has criminal charges on him, and. And so it, the, 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 the situation gets weird because it's like, well, okay, so now someone's in trouble. And I guess, I guess he, uh, I guess, you know, he's going to get himself out of this. He's innocent. He's innocent. He's honorable. He's, you know, this is the, this is the man of God. Why would God let him get into this much trouble? Uh, it, it gets weird when immediately the, the, the two lawyers that are hired are Alan Sawyer and Kenneth Rosenfeld from out in California. And these are like big, uh, not obviously not belonging to the church top-notch like celebrity level lawyers that that you know right. that are that are hired by very rich clients if you look at Kenneth Rosenfeld he has very nice suits and I don't and you know I kind of don't blame them they're lawyers they're getting their hustle and whatever but but when you know when they enter into our little world it gets interesting because uh because these, these people don't buy the big doctrine and whatnot but yet they talk about it and they say that yeah, the 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 apostle's innocent. He's a magic. He's he's just a, a really um, he's a really uh, interesting man. Uh, he's 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 so he's so dignified and whatever. You know, they're sort of like they're lawyers. They're being paid to say this stuff. Um, the so they're in place from uh, from like June 2019, July 2019, and then in August uh, around like early to mid August 2019. Uh, they they no longer become associated with um, with Nason and instead his lawyer becomes Alan Jackson. So what's interesting about so what's interesting about those about that summer is that over that summer they, the the lawyers with you know all the money behind them were really pushing and, and nipping at at the bail that was set on Nason. And then once the bail becomes like uh, settled in late uh, in mid July at fifty million dollars by the judge David Fields. Um, eventually, you know, the lawyers, those two lawyers start to, you know, focus on other things, you know, once they, once that phase of, of the criminal justice system is done, the bail stuff at then, back then, once it's done, um, uh, they start to focus on other things, like starting to discredit certain, uh, charges that are against them. Like, okay, fine. The charges are okay. The bail, the bail is pinned on us. Let's focus on the charges. Um, one of the things that happens around August, 2019 is that the lawyers, uh, in a written, in not in a written statement, but in the actual court document, they say that uh, one, they say that one or at least some of the charges shouldn't apply to Nason because, um, uh, well, what are those charges? The charges were that, like uh, he raped uh, an adult person, a Jane Doe 5, 
uh, an, again, an adult, he raped an adult. And so what the, what the lawyers were saying uh, by August, 2019, in response to, you know, that certain charge or set of charges was that um, Nason isn't, um, Nason can't be in trouble for rape because the person that he had sexual relations to was, uh, was consensual. You know, this was a consensual thing. And so they, they were saying that like, okay, we are going to admit that Nason did have some sort of uh, privacy, some sort of relationship, some sort of something with Jane Doe 5. But, uh, but, uh, but hey, you know, to, to the court, hey, hey to the court, uh, we're saying that, that Nason, uh, that this isn't, this isn't a crime. This is actually something that he does. And this is, you know, adultery is not a crime. But, but still, nevertheless, uh, we think, but this isn't confirmed, but we think that is, that is why uh, the Joaquin family and Nason Joaquin Garcia like kicked away those two lawyers, Alan Jackson and Kenneth Rosenfeld. We think that is why they did that because those lawyers started to resort to that line of argument of like, okay, hey, by the way, we're gonna have to eat away at this idea that you're, that you're innocent and honorable and stuff um, for the purposes of getting you out of jail. Mind you, that goes contradictory to the, pe to the church members' ideas that they have of you. Um, Perfect. But, you would never cheat on your wife, you know, yeah. like, oh, yeah, it wasn't rape. It was consensual. But like, that's still cheating on your wife if it's consensual. Yeah. And if you admit to that, it's kind of like, OK, well, if we thought he was perfect and he's admitting to that, what else might he admit to? So yeah. it like sounds like he didn't want possibly. Right. It sounds like he maybe didn't want to instill any doubt in the membership of the church. Of course, yeah. you know, it's possible that, you know, this really is the Catholic Church putting this all up and, you know, he really didn't do any of those things. So, you know, it is until proven guilty, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I just can't believe like the Catholic, you like who, how many people did they have to pay in order to like front all these uh, charges, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the Catholic Church has yet to pay me for for leaving the church and talking bad. Uh, they owe me the, <laughs> the, the Vatican owes me a check. But um, like, I so, hopefully one day though that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> if I'm going to talk bad about it anyway, I might as well get paid if my salvation is already gone, right? Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, that's crazy. Okay, so sorry, keep going. Um, uh, about the lawyers right. and everything. So, uh, so those two lawyers eventually, you know, leave the picture by that point. And of course, at that point, co coincidentally, or perhaps not, you know, this isn't confirmed, but we think that is why they, they leave. Um, and so again, and, and so, you know, it's, it's like, well, you guys were pinned down in a certain way to where you had to concede to that. And, you know, that says something. And then of course, uh, and then of course, again, like back to the original point, it's like, why, why, why do we even have these lawyers that aren't even part of the church and buy into the whole idea of him being innocent and honorable and the most holiest man on earth? Right. Um, they don't even buy into that. They're just there because they're getting paid and they're professionals. And they're the weird kind of like big time professionals that get hired by like top notch people. So well, their goal isn't to keep membership with the church. Their goal is mm -hmm. to lighten the sentence. So if yeah. they can distill any doubt and say, oh, no, it wasn't rape. It was you know, consensual, that's going to keep his sentence lower. And that's all they really know how to do. Like they they've probably never, haven't worked with a situation like this where, you know, um, he's worried about membership, I'm sure, because that's where his money mm -hmm. comes from. Right. Anyway, keep mm -hmm. going. Yes. So. Uh, so here's where it gets like a little more interesting. Once Alan Sawyer and Kenneth Rosenfeld leave the picture um, in August 2019, the, the next lawyer who comes into play is uh, Alan Jackson. And Alan Jackson is the dude who was in charge of uh, representing Kevin Spacey during his whole Me Too debacle back in like late 2017. So, so again, you know, we have this, was, we have this big celebrity lawyer who, who, just makes a, who just makes a bunch of money and he's really good at his job. Um, uh, now representing like the holiest man on earth, you know? Like I, I'm very sure that like, if you ask, you know, the average church member what they thought about Kevin Spacey and the allegations against them, they would say, yeah, I, I, yeah, I kind of believe them. Yeah. The, you know, celebrities are scummy people. Um, uh, dude, you know, dudes are like that. And yeah, lawyers like, you know, unfortunately, you know, that there's that profession can start, can, can be hired to, you know, uh, handle such things like that. Right. Well, you, you know, cause fast forward to 2019, it turns out that Nason Joaquin Garcia is having his own little me too, mo his own little me too, like, a debacle and then alan jackson gets sucked into this world of, of defending this like cult leader um so 
so yeah, it, th that's basically, that's basically the early months of it. And then um, in 29, in late 2019, it was just a lot of sort of back and forth between the prosecutors and the, and, and the, and the, and Alan Jackson and the rest of the lawyers. Uh, and then uh, this, you know, still sort of like, like um, appeals that are happening. I, it gets really technical and I'll admit, I don't know all the technical right, aspects right. of it, but okay. I do know how to paint it broadly where, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'll add too that. So if you didn't watch our previous video, we talked about when he was arrested, there was a church broadcast sent out. And basically they said he was arrested, but he's innocent and don't watch the news. They said that to the whole church. And it's just, mm. it's crazy. And like you said in our last video, it was incredibly insulting, right? To you as a person that you're not allowed to watch the news. Like, like you don't know better for yourself or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one thing I wanted to say about that was you, you have these, this whole group of people that are depending on this one person in the church, right? And that he's the center of it all. And then all of a sudden he's, he's gone. And how does that affect things? Right. And I, I just wanted to know, um, do you think that it's possible? Cause I know they all think he's innocent, right? And maybe if they happen to run across the news, they'll think he's innocent. But do you think it's possible that some people don't even know why he's arrested still? Like, are there some members that just have no idea? Um, I, I am pretty, uh, to, to some extent, I can imagine there's, there are probably people out there who don't have the idea that this is, th these are, the charges against them are, are sort of sexual in, in nature. Um, but, uh, but uh, this is a whole, this is a whole other like side tangent. Uh, this isn't the first time that uh, charges of sexual crimes have come against the apostle in place. So, so, you know, right now we're living through the, the charges that came into play in 2019 and that, you know, they're still sprawling out and the trial is set to start in late uh, September uh, in within like several 40 ish days or something like that. Um, back in 1997, uh, charges were brought against the previous leader, Samuel Joaquin Flores, who was the father of Nason. Charges were brought in 1997 by a by a first by a, a sort of distant cousin of mine, uh, who who I didn't really know was a cousin of mine up until recently when I started investigating older incidents. But yeah, back in 1997, there was a man Moises Padilla in Guadalajara in Mexico, who brought who brought accusations forward through like the media, and uh, it was him and like maybe some other women. I'm not too sure what exactly happened, but basically what ends up happening is that you know Samuel isn't. Samuel isn't arrested. Samuel isn't, uh, you know, um, it doesn't have a high bell set on him and stuff like that uh, through through some sort of political corruption or something. I'm not too sure what exactly happens, but nothing important happens. And um, yeah, tragically, you know, Samuel gets off scot free from that incident. And, and but there was also but also back then there was the uh, there was this element of don't read the news. Don't watch Telemundo. Um, right. um, yeah, there's. Um, there's going to be some sort of special on TV about us, but don't watch that because uh, that's the devil and whatever. And and I know at some point there was a, there was some sort of news broadcast. No, there was some sort of paper that was like published, some sort of newspaper that was published in Guadalajara, sort of like an expose kind of thing. And the church uh, bought all the copies from the, from the, from the, from the printing place and like burned them or threw them away or something like that. Oh um, but yeah, no, nothing happened back then. So I bring that up because I bring that up because members who have been in since like way back then and who went through that ordeal uh, have this idea that that the Catholic Church or some sort of there's just always been conspiracies against the against the apostles, no matter when. And this is just the second one in like that lineage of of um, of, uh, of attacks against the church. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's it's really tragic. So like from the start, uh, people have been told that, uh, yeah, he's innocent, his honorable. Maybe you know what he's being charged for. Maybe you don't, but maybe, so if you do, don't worry about it. Cause it's just, it's basically the same thing from like over two decades ago and you're oh used to it gosh. and you know, uh -huh. oh my, so yeah. they even have that previous evidence to be, to point out be like, oh, you know, it wasn't a big deal with Samuel. Yeah. So obviously it's just God testing us again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh it, it's God testing the new apostle, you know? And, and again, it goes back to the sort of origin story and the sort of like mission statement that they give. When Nasson comes into power in 2014, he's saying that like God told me the church is going to grow to an unimaginable extent. Um, um, my time has come. Um, we, you all have to believe. You know, we all have to believe and consolidate around me. 
And then of course, when something happens, it's like you, the, the, the thinking you're, you're conditioned to think that like, Oh no, this is God um, testing us. I better like, I better be careful because I want to be, I want to be there two, three decades down the line when the church has exploded in population and whatever. Um, it's really, it's, it's, it's not cool. But one, one more detail about the 1997 thing. Um, so those accusations are brought forward by someone like Moises Padilla. And then eventually, um, you know, nothing really happens. But one thing that happened to Moises was at some point he was kidnapped by people. We don't know who, no one was arrested or anything. Uh, he was kidnapped by people and taken in like a, a van and maybe taken somewhere else or something. But he ended up with like uh, around 60 stab wounds around his torso and upper body very small there's video of this you can look it up from like telemundo and stuff and um uh you you know the it, it's 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 terrible to bring that up but like um you know when certain when a certain pressure was put on the church way back then um violence manifested in this way yeah. and um then that and not to say that sort of violence is going to manifest against anyone right now that is happening although it has kind of happened to some people uh, not, not, but it's not to say that violence is going to ma manifest towards everyone that that does leave. Um, but there there is that sort of thing that has happened. And that, you know, sort of feeds into the fears of why people don't want to leave the right. organization right now. Right, because um, you could yeah. actually be shunned or maybe hurt by, you know, someone you care about. Then people who think that they have this this righteous um reason to do harm is terrifying right it's mm. just it's terrifying to have a group of people who think that you know that they're that they have a good reason to hurt someone or to you know to do something like that is just is terrifying mm -hmm. okay so take us back through the timeline a little more i think it would be helpful to know more of what happened after the they switched lawyers and also um how you know how, how has COVID affected things and I wonder if that possibly will push the trial back um anyway so so take us take us through that yeah for sure um so uh sort of back to so so another one was first arrested in June 2019 and then uh we kind of left off around August 2019 when his first set of lawyers go away because for some reason but everyone thinks that and I'm pretty sure it's pretty much confirmed that um it's because the the lawyers back then, Kenneth Rosenfeld and Alan Sawyer, were starting to concede to certain things in court to get him out of, you know, to get him out of trouble legally. But they were the, in the way that they were conceding to charges and accusations made ate away at the at the propaganda that is all around Nason of him being innocent and honorable, and he would never he would never have sex outside of marriage, and he's married, and he's a very holy man. He's too busy. He's too busy praying for us all. <laughs> churches and visiting churches all around the world to be to be engaged in that sort of you know disgusting stuff right um, he's, just, he's so. too busy praying to rape anyone it makes sense it's good defense it's <laughs> oh, no. and, and, and honestly uh this is this is actually like a, a fun tangent but in the world cup in 2018 that summer the, there's video of him hanging out with his maybe his wife but for sure his mother and like a posse of other church members like five four several just an, a, a group of about 10 people in total mostly you know a lot of them are like women secretaries there's video of him hanging out in russia for the world cup in 2018 going you know he's wearing a mexico jersey and he's in the hotel room and, and he's not in the hotel room he's in a he's in the lobby of a hotel and he's going to go up on the elevator and stuff um right, right. back then in that summer, uh, a former a former minister who who had left since like the 80s or since like the 90s or something like that, um, actually ended up like crossing paths with him over there. Now, someone didn't notice him, but the dude noticed him. the The former pastor noticed him and took video of this. And so, uh, and so that video is out there, and it's like, okay, well, your your apostles like fucking like spending your money out and at the, out at the World Cup with the rest of his family, and he's wearing sunglasses and like a hat. And it's, it really is him. And cause there's other people in, in the crowd that there's other people in the group that look like his family right. members. And, you know, so that, that, that happens, but yeah, there's this idea that for some reason, this dude is just way too holy and busy to be doing stuff, but no, he's obviously doing stuff. Right. Um, right. Pretty apparent that, yeah, he's not always using the money just to help the church or whatever. Like he's doing yeah. fun things with people, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a crime, you know, until 
you know, all the more recent stuff came out. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so uh and so yeah from uh so he has like top-notch lawyers and a big bail over him and they, they're ob they're obviously going to pay a lot they're going to pay the lawyers whatever they can to stall the thing out to um to dismiss certain charges to, to really focus on very on technical on legal technicalities in order to buy more time or to get him out you know through some just you know crappy way uh you know that's the thing and so and so all for the rest of 2019, he's still arrested and there's, you know, sort of little appeals and like preliminary and like more sort of like court hearings that haven't, you know, that, that they're putting, that they're putting and asking for the lawyers, especially that they're asking for in order to stall off the start date of the trial, which, you know, now it's 2021 and the start date of the trial so far is like late September. But, uh, but yeah, in those, in those months, there's just a lot of sort of back and forth and wasting of time from from the lawyers buying of time from them right um uh and, and and so then in february 2020 uh the church the church has its uh holy supper celebration in california and uh, i didn't go to that one but my family did go and so you know coronavirus wasn't a thing yet you know to the extent that it eventually became in around early march for sure um and so you know people are still going to that and um People are still going to that. They're being a part of it uh, around. And then uh, uh, the day prior to the Holy Supper in February 2020. So that would be February 13th, 2020. Uh, a another former secretary who was not a Jane Doe, was not a Jane Doe in the present criminal case. Uh, this person, Sochil Martin, was a sort of former secretary of Nason, knew him like years back. She brought forth a civil suit in, in L.A. Um, against against Nason and other top ranking members of the church. That civil suit right now is on pause until the criminal case is over with, and then the civil stuff can come into play. Right. But um, but yeah, that happened, and um, but yeah, that happened, and this uh, this was the first time that that members had a had a face to lock onto as of like who is on the other side, who is the sort of ex members that are trying to take down our apostle, and yeah, so Chu Martin becomes a very like uh, prominent you know. Uh, person in like the media showing her face and stuff but uh but she's actually not very important in the present criminal case at all it's the it's the jane does that are uh present right now so mm -hmm. the jane does obviously they're um a non like they're under this anonymous umbrella for their own protection mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but i wonder if members of the church view that as oh they don't actually have someone that's why they're saying jane doe but it's because they don't actually have someone accusing the prophet mm -hmm. or the apostle I, i'm curious do you think that's possible no that that is that is very possible i have heard that plenty of times uh even you know uh, a lot of the a lot of these uh church members aren't from the united states they didn't grow up here and uh you know no offense to them but a lot of them aren't very don't don't have degrees of higher education and so like right. the, these court systems and the sort of understandings of different branches of government and the uh, um understandings of of different processes in in the criminal case they don't really understand them. And yeah, I, me and a lot of other people encountered in those first early months when the bail hearings were happening, those first weeks where people were like, well, where are the victims? Why aren't they showing up to the bail hearings? And, and well, our response is like, well, there, some of them are children, I'm sorry. And you, you can't you can't just demand that they like, ex, ex, you know, expose themselves in that way. And plus, if, you know, they they went to the prosecutors first and the prosecutors are, are know how to handle this thing. And they're going to tell them, don't say a peep to anybody you know we're going to put you under police protection just bide your time and wait for us to handle the thing you know adequately as it should be in this country that we live in with like its own you know system of system of justice that we try to like adhere to and right um yeah there was a, there was definitely a lot of confusion about that you still hear that even up to this day where it's just like there are no victims um they uh they haven't shown up in the court and then uh, even if they do show up like, oh, well, they're they're just it's just a, it's a conspiracy or maybe they're paid off by the Catholic Church and uh, the attorney general at the time uh, when the arrest first happened was Javier de Becerra and he's a Catholic. And so then they're like, oh, well, it's the Catholics that 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 are doing this. And um, and he they're just jealous of the church's growth and they're trying to get a hit on us and whatever. It, it's a lot of junk. 
and, and so, in the last video we mentioned that the, mm -hmm. the census they did in Mexico more recently revealed that there's probably closer to 200,000 members, whereas they claim to have 5 million, but Worldwide. even 5 million wouldn't threaten the Catholic Church. Like, are you kidding? No. <laughs> it's just so funny. So yeah, yeah, keep going, keep yeah. going. The, the, the census that, that you're referring to is just for Mexico, and they counted the Inegi, uh, I-N-E-G-I, -E this came out earlier this year. And they tallied up how many La Luz del Mundo members they could find in Mexico, and it was less than 200,000. And Mexico is the headquarters of, of uh, La Luz del Mundo. And then it's like, well, well, hold on, like, um, like, no, it, it doesn't make sense. It, 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 that's a very inconsistent, like, uh, those are two, like, claims that, those are two puzzle pieces that just don't work together in no, terms okay. of, like, no. uh, this claim that there's so many members. So, so yeah, by the time it's early 2020, there's, uh, you know, the, the trial is still half, the, 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 the dude is still arrested and he's still like, um, in jail. And there's still a lot of volleying between the, the prosecutors and the, um, and the defense lawyers, uh, by the time that quarantine happens, obviously, you know, like, uh, court, the court systems, I'm not too sure if they shut down completely, but, but they certainly get like clogged up and, you know, that certainly puts some sort of clogs in the system. Right. and has stretched it out to the present day. Uh, one ugly thing that really started to happen around March 2020 when quarantine became, a, when quarantining and uh, coronavirus like hysteria came into play worldwide um, was that uh, I remember seeing members and uh, some people in my own family, but other members, you know, start, started saying this where there was a sort of like sick line of logic where they were saying just as, just as humanity has decided to arrest the man of God, so has God decided to arrest humanity, you know, quarantining, you know, like this is God's punishment. That, <laughs> oh, no. yeah. yeah. And that timing is, is pretty indicative of that because he was arrested in 2019. Mm -hmm. So for coronavirus to have in 2020, it just makes sense. Yeah. For, for them, it's, you know, it the worldview is like, here's another sign that God is really, really mad. And oh God is, God. Uh, God really wants to test us and, oh, you better buckle down and stay in this thing. Um, all those people that left, let them leave because the coronavirus is here to get them. This is, this is another, this is also a way for God to punish these people that are, <laughs> that have left the church and are trying to live more liberal lives. Well, oh screw them. God. They're going to be quarantined and they're oh. not going to go to the clubs. And they and can't whatever. go to clubs. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, this is crazy because it just shows you the extent that confirmation bias can so incredibly um, manipulate someone's perspective. And you just because you realize like these things that otherwise just seem very rational, like, like, uh, the, like the coronavirus spreading, like that happens, you know, sicknesses happen and they spread and it's scary. Those things happen. But when you're when you're part of this um, religious uh, you know organization that's telling you you know that there there's all these things that God is doing to punish people, then whenever you see something like that happening, confirmation bias kicks in. And you say this is proof that my religious um, upbringing and and truth, like things that I was taught, are true. Because look coronavirus is happening and it's punishing everyone it's like and then it just solidifies you deeper into that belief so again looking on this from the outside you can say oh that's so weird they think he has magic powers they think this they think that you think it's so weird but when you're in that conditioning from birth it doesn't sound weird it actually makes so much sense right it's mm -hmm. it's crazy anyway so keep going yeah, uh, so that's uh, March 2020. Uh, in early April 2020, um, the the lawyers uh, the lawyers of, of Nason managed to snag a little win, and this is kind of basically the only win that they have. But in the face of the other sort of wins that the prosecutors have had, um, mm -hmm. this it's very small. But uh, but I think it's important because it, I'll explain right now. So what happens in like um, early April 2020? is a judge, uh, Jose, Josue Joel Lomeli. I know his last name is Lomeli. Um, he, uh, through, uh, he, he made a technical mistake in like scheduling a certain, in certain dates, uh, certain court dates. Like he didn't put enough time between two different dates or he didn't do something fast enough, didn't set a date like quick or something like that. Some kind um, of technicality. Right? Yeah, it, it was a technicality. 
And on those, and, you know, these lawyers, you know, had latched onto this technicality that Loma, that Loma Lee messed up on, not the prosecutors, not, not, um, you know, not the prosecutors, the executive branch of the government. It was, you know, the, the, the judicial branch of the government, the dude there, uh, who was separate from the other people, you know, he's the one who made a mistake, but the lawyers, you know, latch onto that. And then, and then of course they tried to like, you know, uh, tamp down on the, on the prosecutor's case. Uh, so yeah, he makes a technical mistake in terms of some sort of scheduling. That's literally what it is. And the charges are dropped. Like the charges are dropped. The original set of charges are dropped. Um, but, but if you know, if, but if you know anything about, um, like the way these, these criminal cases happen, that happens sometimes. And that when that happened, uh, the prosecutors weren't worried because they could just slap the charges on again. And, you know, Nason could not, it's not like, it's not like Nason was going to step out of jail. It was like, no, he's going to stay in jail. We're just, um, like what, when, when the schedule, when, when the timing is right, we're just going to keep him in there and just set a new set of charges. Uh, so, so a new we, set of charges does come into play. It was and, more like, uh, they're buying, higher. it was more like sorry? buying time than kind it's of buying time. So, so from the lawyer's perspective, we're being paid by Nison. Uh, they are, they are, they're focusing in on this technicalities and looking for every little which way to weasel in and out of this trouble, you know, to weasel right. their client out of this trouble. Uh, you know, they do that to buy time for themselves, you know, cause they're lawyers and they want to, I guess they want to do a good job for themselves. Um, uh, and then on another end, they uh, it's, it's also time that it is bought in order to just further intimidate victims, further and in, further intimidate the survivors who, are participating, you know, who are going to serve, who are going to like testify and present their testimony and stuff. Um, and then, and then, so that, that's it from the, from the perspective of the, of the, of the lawyers from, but, and then from the perspective of the church, you know, uh, the church, normal church members will notice this, like, oh, the charges were dropped. And then they start, you know, building a lot of propaganda around it. Like, oh, he's going to return, start to prepare yourself, start to reach out to those people that left. Or start to reach out to that member in your family that's a little weak in their faith because um, because look it's really going to happen right now and uh, right. something's on its way right. and um, right. yeah that was that was actually really tragic to see and to and to like explain to people because it's like because it's like you we um it, it's just a lot of gaslighting it's just a lot of gaslighting and and uh and a continual like undermining of people's of people's like self-confidence and just being able to educate themselves um mind you like th this is technical stuff mind you like not to brag or anything but like i'm a smart kid and when it comes to like right. educating myself on on all the lawyery stuff that's happening and the all the terminology of of the of the courts and whatnot um i don't pay attention to it because it, it really is a lot like i have my right. own like set of schooling that i need to do and i just it's just hard to, to keep a certain part of my head so dedicated to that stuff. And so, you know, this is where I come into play. It, this is where I feel like I can come into play where I can just sort of simplify things for people, read them really technically and then summarize it for people uh, out here. Um, right. So yeah, that happens in April. And then of course, like a day or two later or something like that, the charges are slapped right back on him and the same people. And, uh, and so it's like, you know, back to square one, we're gonna start doing bail hearings again. That's April 2020. The second set of bail hearings does happens in uh, late July, August, and early August 2020. And again, there's it's it's more bail hearings, uh, but this time at the bail hearings, the there are officers testifying to to the videos that they saw on Nason's phone, to the testimonies that were given to them by uh, by the survivors, by the Jane Doe's. And it gets very explicit and it's really, it's like really like stomach churning stuff, uh, like very, you know, things, things of like orgies in bed and uh, uh, men being, you know, young men being involved in some things and text messages, text mex message, text messages between Nason and his groomers where he's talking about things he wants to do and roofies and, and like uh, certain dresses. And like, it's really, it's really, it's, it's that sort of stuff that they're, talking about um so then so yeah the, the bail hearings end in at, at that period in august 2020 literally a year ago right and uh since then we've had to it, it's just been a lot of back and forth and waiting for the actual trial to start so right. uh so again like the only win that la, the la luz del mundo side the nason joaquin side has had was this technical mistake from lomeli back in spring 2020 
and and fine like you know they follow the rules and you know you give them their extra time and it sucks that it has to go all back to square one but um but uh uh i i i just feel like um if only people were able to inform themselves they oh, this whole mess of everything could like make sense to them right, and right and you know it's the lawyers and it's the propagandists also who are just trying to nab onto anything to to get the client out of trouble or to make him seem like he like he's not in so much trouble and um it just there's just a lot of fake news that floats around uh and then towards the end of 2020 like prior to the election um no no yeah like around election time um and then prior to the exit of uh of donald trump there was there was there was even some rumor that that donald trump was going to pardon nason joaquin because supposedly he had heard about nason and he was like yeah what's happening to him isn't cool and it was just really stupid. It's like, like even I even started to hear theories like that or thoughts like that floating around. And uh, for me, it was like, no, that's not going to happen. He doesn't give a crap about not so, and he has other things to worry about. Right. But even the fact that you guys are floating that around is indicative of the fact that you guys are trying to look for these sort of like hail Mary exits out of this ugly situation. Um, right. Yeah. And so and so, yeah, uh, you know, up to this year, uh, I believe the last court hearing that was that was significant was like, like in March or February, I'm not or April, I believe April. But but basically, ever since one of those months this spring, we've known that the trial was set to start in late September, and up until now, so far, it hasn't moved or anything. And we're we just inch closer to it, and I'm just you know crossing my fingers that we finally that the lawyers are finally out. Uh, of outs that they're they're out of outs right now and uh, they're just going to have to be forced to be pushed into trial and it's there that um you know evidence of things is going to be shown and people's testimonies are going to be given the actual victims are going to show up in the courtroom and give their face and stuff but of course like some of them are children and this thing and this court case isn't going to be broadcasted like on tv or anything like that but um uh, yeah, that's the sort of position that we're in right now. And it's just uh, right now, like for us ex-members who have left uh, prior to the arrest, you know, in the aftermath of the arrest, ever since the arrest, uh, for us, it is, uh, I think, um, uh, for, for me, for me personally, uh, mission number one is like, just get people out, just like, just cast as much doubt as you can out there while the iron is hot. And then once this moment of reckoning comes for everyone, and, you know, whatever, you know, a decision comes out, it's like, uh, this will be a moment where a lot of people can speak up and say an exit, you know, in mass in numbers and you know, there's strength in numbers. Um, I mentioned this in a number of, um, right. of other interviews before. And I really like this, this idea uh, that I've had since ever since I saw this movie, 1960 Spartacus. Have you seen this with uh, Kirk, Kirk something, Kirk Douglas, not Kirk Douglas, he, no, he died I have, I have, he's like a hundred year old actor. Right. He died like a year or two ago. Oh, cool. So, yeah, so very succinctly in, in Sparta, in 1960 Spartacus, Spartacus is a, a, an enslaved person in the Roman Empire. And at some point he starts, he escapes and he starts to get other people to escape. And so he's, he has his own little group of escaped enslaved people. And their plan is to run away to like the coast of somewhere, get some, but someone is supposed to come and get them in boats. And then they're supposed to escape to, an, to out of the Roman Empire and go live their life. And, you know, um, so in the movie, you know, it's that it's that whole ordeal, that whole path up to that. And then prior to them escaping, they encounter the Romans and the Romans like have this big battle with them and they fight and a lot of people die. But at the end of the movie, uh, there's about 100 uh, escaped enslaved people that are huddled up uh, on like some field and there's Romans around them. And then the Roman like uh, leader comes over. He's like, hey, uh, we're all we're. Uh, let's make a deal. You're all going to not die. We're not going to punish you. You're just going to return back to slavery. Uh, but you have to do one thing. You have to tell us who Spartacus is or have Spartacus turn himself in. Like, just tell us that. Just give us that dude. Just give us that dude who started this whole mess. And the rest of you, you know, you won't die. You, we won't crucify you. Just you were going to go. You're just going to go back into slavery back to your normal life. Just give us this one person who like decided to speak out. And so in the movie, you know, Kirk, I think it is Kirk Douglas. I think that's his name, the name of the actor. Kirk Douglas looks around and he's like, yeah, I'm going to turn myself in. I can't, I don't want anyone else to get in trouble. Um, I, you know, I did start this and you know, I just want to let other people not have a crappy death. Um, he gets up to say he's Spartacus, but the dude next to him gets up and says, no, I'm Spartacus. And then there's like another dude, like five feet back. He's like, no, I'm Spartacus. 
and then everyone and then like a group of three and then just some more and more people it's a really it's there's a wonderful clip of it on youtube yeah. i bring it up because it's like it was this sort of moment of reckoning for the enslaved people and what they were trying to do against the face of this like conglomerate of the roman empire that was enslaving them um and it was this giant like f you to all of them you know right. and uh you know unfortunately like all of those people die but 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 still like uh, i love that because it, it sort of um paints the picture of, of what it is like to speak out in mass and have the ability to do that and uh you know that's where like someone like like myself comes into play not to brag or anything but like i'm a right. pretty smart dude and i can educate and i know how to educate myself and i can be pretty articulate about certain things that i'm very very passionate about and i'm incredibly passionate about like dismantling this horrific like stupid idea that of, of a religion that people have had in their lives for so long um right uh that so yeah that's where we that's where we come in that's what we're doing right now in these sort of weeks that are leading up to the trial and if it is pushed back um you know like so be it i hope it's for the better um and, and for the better being like more charges come forward maybe more people have come forward and the prosecutors are more overwhelmed with like things they have to organize you know um sure. um uh yeah it's just about hitting the, the iron while it's hot and just creating like just just creating immense pressure, putting my face out there, putting pressure on people from Houston that knew me as a kid and making them think, you know, maybe the fact that I'm starting to speak out can make Houston people people. start to think for themselves. Um, Doing content in English is really important. Like you said in uh, in this video or in the previous video that there's not a lot of English, there's not a lot of English content. And and if anything, it's also about like um, me, myself, like giving my testimony and you know proving that like hey i know i know the shit like don't don't tell me that i wasn't an actual member that didn't understand anything i know i know the stuff in and out but i'm just going to narrate it and articulate it in a certain way that makes you start to question it and makes you start to recognize that hey uh i'm in this weird group and i'm not the only person in the world in a weird group yes yes there's, there's nexium there's scientology there's the mormon church there's uh there's um there's witnesses yeah there, there's right there, there's a lot of other sort of coercive groups and it's just like it, for for me it's been about like uh just making my world not for for me just you know me and my struggles like growing up within the organization that they they really made my world really small um yeah. and for me it's it's about just helping other people uh articulate these things recognize that there's just a lot of unweird practices that happen that they just sort of didn't question as they grew up in them and that, Hey, you know, we actually, uh, we can speak up for ourselves and talk about our, and talk about our experiences. And that, that literally helps like other people. Like oh. while we were on break earlier, I, I was literally responding to someone who just sent me their phone number. Like in the first message, they're like, Hey, like, uh, can you talk to me? Today's hard. And yeah. you know, like eventually like, you know, we get to do that. Um, yeah. so last, last, uh, Last week, I was back in Houston since prior to right. the last time, you know, right, right where I grew up, I was, I was last there in late 2019. And, you know, we can talk about this uh, in, in a bit, but uh, sort of for this, uh, for this, for the purposes of like what's happening with the trial and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I, re- I returned back to my hometown. And if you drive along like Highway 59, uh, I, I thought I've thought of, I've thought so much the past couple of weeks about how like how small the church like really tried to make my world where it was like, I went to church at this weird Roman temple in the middle of suburb of the suburban hood. And this weird, like weird, just Roman temple that just doesn't look like a church at all. And you could tell something fishy is happening there. If you don't go there, right. if you drive, if you just drive past it, you know, they're right along the freeway. And then like a mile down the road is where I, I worked seven years at a grocery store, uh, for, you know, seven years throughout high, you know, the, the last right. half of high school, all of undergrad, and then another mile down the road is where I grew up and lived and that was my house. And so, you, you know, like I bring that up because it's, I recognize that like within these set square of miles, a gigantic percentage of my life was just like, like, was like 90% of your people. life was in this little, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. bubble. And, and, right. Yeah. And it wasn't until like undergrad, you know, um, that I was going to the other side of town to go to the university uh, driving there back and forth I didn't have a dorm because you know I was supposed to live with my parents I couldn't be out of their supervision as like a young man um right, right. Uh, and I was saving money like that's cool but but still right. like it, that, there was that it was it was really more about the effort of keeping me like locked in and and contained this thing. Right. yeah and it wasn't until undergrad when I was going to like the university and sitting in um sitting in an auditorium of like 500 people and like 
I'm like, why are there 500 people in here? I've only been in rooms of 500 people with like church, but no, we're here to listen to this dude talk about the history of slavery in this country. And I wanted to, I want to expose you to all these things that the U S has done. And Hey, and, and then later in the afternoon, you're going to go to a class where you discuss like the theory of mind and robots and AI. And, and then, and then tomorrow you have a class on, on Latin American history and you're going to learn about the Catholic church. And like, you know, it right. was, um, right. uh, the church really focuses on making your world super gigantically small. And yeah, in my, in my like personal journey, it's been about making it larger. And then now it's about like, well, I've been exposed to a lot of things and I'm fairly smart and I can, I feel like I can articulate this to other people and help them guide themselves out of it. Yeah. 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 So, so the last couple of things I want to talk about in this video mm -hmm. is, do you think so far all of the accusations coming up against Nasson have allowed more people to leave La Luz del Mundo? Uh, yes, I think so. I think the moment that, that Nason was arrested and then in the in the time that we have had to just bind and sort of like just grip our hands. Yeah, everyone's been sort of told to just shut your eyes for so long. Curiosity, you know, has gotten the best of a lot of people. Right. And um, uh, a lot of people are still uh, physically going, but I know mentally that they are not. And so that's right. sort of one of the benefits also of, uh, so that, that's one of the, that's something that has happened generally across the whole ordeal where it's like, it's taken too long. Uh, I heard this, I thought he was gonna leave back in April, 2020. Oh, so he's back in jail. And then it's like, um, oh, uh, there's this judge. And then this other judge was involved. And like, you're telling me this other judge is looking at this thing. This, this is starting to not sound like a conspiracy. Why are there so many people involved? Right. Is, right. is a conspiracy really that large? Um, right. And then, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, for sure. The, this ordeal has put a lot of pressure on some people and has changed relationships. And then it's changed the tone of how uh, certain sermons are given. Um, uh, if you, ba back, in, back in spring 2020, it, there was this weird, there was this weird thing where uh, a lot of the, the initials of Nason were taken out of the church and a lot of the sort of language, the little decorations inside were changed. Oh, like they were really changed. So Nason comes into play and there's a lot of NJG just all over the church and little logos and like a emblem and, you know, stuff like that. Um, right around the start of 2020, uh, a lot of people on the subreddit started to take, started to report that within their own local church um, location, uh, a lot of those, a lot of those, the, the branding was starting to change. Wow. Mind you, Nason is still at the center of it all, theologically speaking, up until okay. the present day, but, but still those sorts of things were happening and people They're like started away. to notice that. Yeah. People start to notice that and that wakes some people up. Uh, and then of course, when, the, when, sermons are being given on very important like spiritual days and then the sermons are about how don't listen to don't listen to your son who who's talking trash don't listen to this person or that person um you know people take notice of that too and that starts to eat away at like their confidence in the whole thing uh one other point that i'll make is that uh another cool well one of the silver linings about quarantine happening while this trial was was going on is that when people were quarantining you know the churches shut down and people weren't attending mind you like Right. church services were still happening over zoom and right. uh but but still like i i Much I'd less like, accountability yeah, than showing up yeah. in person right yeah yeah I, but uh attendance was still happening uh on zoom right. but yeah. but still the, the thing was that like i liked the idea of people not having to go through the little ritual of driving to church arriving there at the parking lot going up and sitting down to pray and again to look around with everyone who's there and sort of like and then hanging out after the church service is over and then seeing your friends and stuff like that. Like I liked the idea of how quarantine started to sort of even like scramble that and try to eat away at the, at the community that could happen um, within the church. There was also talk about how uh, God, this isn't official, but you know, there was some talk and accusations from some members saying that like, Oh, the ex members are going to get coronavirus and we're not. Uh, but then like, of course, like some, some <laughs> members ended up getting coronavirus and passing away, including some like top-notch um, ministers. Um, oh uh, yeah, that it's 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 really um, yeah, again. Th this is like the, the iron has been turned on, and it's just right. like we have to. We just have to keep like hammering at it. Oh my gosh! Um, oh, that is insane. So tell us, what does a normal member uh, or an ex-member experience if they try to talk to their family about Nason and the trial and the church? you know, not being what it says that it is, 
what does a normal member experience like in that interaction? Does their family just shut them down or deflect or just totally shun them? What happens in those situations? Uh, it's an array of that. Uh, I know it's definitely, uh, it, when it, if it reaches a certain level of just like, we're talking one past one another and we can't, and you, you're, you're, you're exactly what what that dude was preaching about two weeks ago uh it, it goes up to shunning and it's just like totally shunning but of course the the situation differs with a lot of people um and then of course it also matters what sort of age you're at and if you're still like living with your parents and if if you're financially dependent upon them um uh it matters if like you're if you're married and if like it, how do you well you're, you're married to this person how do you start to speak to them in a certain way to get them to start questioning things what if you guys have a child in play? What if you, what if the in-laws are, you know, are, are con they're sort of present in your life a lot and are you going to, how do you handle them? Um, uh, it gets really ugly, but yeah, th there's definitely, there's definitely like uh, a demand to not read the news. Don't do that. Um, that, that is just the medium through which the devil is going to, is going to uh, talk to you through. Um, there's also the sort of uh, well, if you're going to admit that you're questioning or something like that, don't talk to me, go speak to the minister in private or something like that. And then right. of course it's like, uh, you know, that, that these people are very dense and financially dependent upon the, uh, upon the organization. They're not going to really concede so much to you and they're going to, they're going to do their job in terms of keeping, keeping you in check and keeping you like, at, keeping you inside. Um, mm -hmm. and then of course, like telling you, okay, well say you are going through your doubts. Don't voice them to anybody else. You're going to spoil it. You're going to spoil the spiritual um, career of your best friend, you know? And what, what if this church is right? And guess what? You're going to take them down with you too. Like, that would be shitty. Why don't you just, you know, let yourself go to, to hell? Right. Uh, you know, there's oh just God, a lot why of- Why would you risk it? Why would you risk your own yeah. salvation, let alone your children's salvation, let alone your friends and all of that? Oh my gosh, that's crazy. And my, my, I think my last yeah. question, and, mm -hmm. and we'll see if anything else comes up from it, but how do you think- members are going to react if he is found guilty um i uh it, it's it's evolved over time so definitely from the start it was like oh no he's going to get out very quickly he's innocent he's honorable etc but then of course when when his lawyers his previous lawyers start to admit in court documents that like oh he did have sex extramarital sex with this person and it wasn't and it wasn't rape uh it was just it was normal um uh and then um, uh, I, I bring that up because like slowly over time, the goalposts have changed, uh, to the point where at some point, you know, people start to think and say, well, if he's going to stay in, if he's going to stay in, in, in jail forever, uh, I'm still going to believe no matter what, he's still the leader, the walls, the walls of, you know, stone walls, co concrete walls can't contain the authority of God that, that is, that is placed in this man. And, right. um, people are still going to believe. And some people, and uh, this is actually really interesting. I'm, I'm so incredibly interested how the ministry that's the higher ups are going to react to when Nason is, I kind of very confidently think that he is going to be uh, convicted. Uh, I, I, I just like daydream so much about how that'll come into play and how that'll happen. Or, or I'm sorry, how, how that'll come into play and how they're going to react to it. Are they going to elevate the next person uh, in line in this in right. this lineage of the family to the to the throne, uh, and so Nason's only son is Adoraim Joaquin, and there's a lot to say about Adoraim, but he's not a very articulate man. He's about my age, and he, he twenty like mid twenties, and um, back in the Holy Supper of in August 2019, so like a couple months after after Nason's arrest. Um, uh, it, oddly enough, Adoraim played a played a big role in speaking at the Holy Supper, and mind you, another minister was like, you know, they were kind of taking turns, something like that. But uh, Adoraim is it was never someone who was very, who was like who you would see on transmissions or who was known as like a uh, a, a speaker at like a high level who could speak to a lot of uh, a lot of people. It was um, he did not speak well. He was stuttering a lot. He was very nervous. You could tell. And sort of a kind of like a weak voice and not to like make fun of him, but like, but, but when, uh, that was the last day I actually went to church and it was, I'm kind of happy that I stayed in until that point. Cause it was just fucking funny. It was just really funny right, inside right. Seeing, seeing this, you know, this young man, this kid being pushed to the, to the, to the attention, to the full attention at the, uh, at, at the biggest like celebration that the church has annually. 
in front of everyone's eyeballs and it's just like everyone's looking at him and they're not saying explicitly like hey this is the new this is the next dude in line but it's still it was still like so overtly a uh, sort of right right a selling campaign uh, of the kid uh mind oh, you the idea goodness. behind it was that like the apostle the apostle asked that his kid be the one to to do the sermon and we're going to follow the apostles wishes but you know just very overtly like it was oh yeah it was just terrible mind you since then i, I am not aware of adoraim taking taking lead or speaking at some sort of big you know church event like that i don't think it's happened since then because and i'm pretty sure he was really made fun of and stuff uh right. for that right uh, but uh yeah that's another sort of possibility people are also thinking about um well well maybe um uh some some other some other member of the Joaquin family is going to come in as like the surrogate, uh, not as an apostle, but he's going to be, he's going to be the one dude who's talking to Nason and then Nason, and then he's just going to communicate right. with him okay. to the rest of the church, something like that. Um, but who knows? Like, I really wonder, I, uh, like, I, I really, I really wonder because um, the idea of Nason, because there was a certain idea of Samuel that he built up to up and, you know, throughout his 50 years as the apostle, you know, at first, he didn't really start off so much as the apostle, but eventually, you know, his authority and the ideas around him really grew. The church really, 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 really grew during the time of Samuel up into 2014. And then when, you know, when Nathan comes into play uh, a week after Samuel's death in late 2014, um, he inherits, you know, that big bubble around him. And right, so, you know, that big right. bubble transfers the ideology and the, and the authority behind him and so on. And it's just like, well, you know, just like uh five six seven years later um right. like well like less than five years later he's arrested and then there's just this other this other big like colossus that comes crashing down on all of it and it, it sort of uh sparks a lot of doubt in people i'd like to think and if not that then that's what we're here for it's like we're here to we're here to to really just add uh more like fuel to the little sparks that are that are happening in people's heads I don't, I, I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, I love talking about what theories about what could happen with people. I, I love discussing that, but, uh, uh, but we, we, I don't have a, I don't have a firm answer. And, and I like that no one else has a firm answer. And, and the fact that we have all these like really like ideas of, of where the ministry, the higher ups could take it um, uh, really just speaks to the fact that this whole thing is just a, it's just a, like spiritual mafia it's just spiritual like just uh it's ponzi scheme you know it's just this uh yeah it's just trash right right that's yeah absolutely i think um i think the hope is that this will continue to be a wake-up call for a lot of people but mm -hmm. as we've seen um in you know like in other you know religious groups and stuff that sometimes even a huge wake-up call isn't enough and again it's like for those who are looking on the outside of this it's like it's like if you grew up your whole life and everyone's told you the sky is blue right it's a fact that's how it feels now Son is the most beloved the most precious like it's just a fact it just is it feels that true and so um one day someone walks up to you and tells you the sky is green you're like are you kidding me like that person does not know what they're talking about that's literally how ingrained it is when you're indoctrinated to these truths for so at such a young age and so vulnerably um anyway it's just it's so it's so fascinating to me and i'm very curious to see what happens with the trial what happens with the membership what happens with the ministry so AJ, please come back and talk to us again. Sure. Um, I would love that. Um, and I'd even love to do like a live Q&A sometime. Uh, comment below if you'd like to see a live Q&A with AJ, because I know there are, are so many more questions um, that all of you probably have about this religion and about the trial. Um, yeah. Do you have any closing thoughts? And then, of course, everyone, don't forget, we're also going to do another video talking about AJ's personal story of leaving the religion. Um, any closing thoughts, AJ? Uh, no, just thank you for having us on. Uh, th sorry, thank you for having me on and sort of uh, pointing the attention of, of your uh, of your audience towards our own little thing happening, you know, in the in the next neighboring country in Mexico. But, you know, it's happening in the U.S. But like uh, th this is, a you know. Uh, I, I just grew up in a certain community that has this this weird religious idea that you know was hammered into me as a kid on my mother's knee, um, and then at some point it's like uh, it, it's it's also 
Uh, th this is also like a story about like the internet too. And like the, this, the, even the fact that, that we can like even connect across the continent like this to talk about how to, to talk about like similar upbringings that we have that have um, a lot of similarities in terms of just culture and ideology and, and then how these, you know, these, um, these like just random weirdos start to babble on about certain things and it evolves into something much more. And, you know, it's not just like Joseph Smith and it's not just um, Eusebio Joaquin, it's, uh, it's, um, it's people like Keith Raniere and L. Ron Hubbard and uh, a lot of other um, uh, sick people like that, that, uh, that we, that, that take advantage of people and make their worlds really small. But, uh, but through, through the sort of internet and through like understandings of like history and um, our own like self-education and self empower and like um, uh, ideas of self-empowerment and self self-education, uh, we can like help people recognize that, that there's, there's uh, there's some gross like territory to navigate throughout in the world, but and and we all go through it in our own way. But um, but you know we're we're all smarter than we think, and we we just can't like we just can't like allow stuff like this to happen. We we just can't we just can't allow people to have bad ideas. And so yeah, actually, here's the perfect thing that I want to end on. Um, uh, there's a quote by Majid Nawaz. Majid Nawaz is a Islamist, is an Islam reformist. Uh, a lot of people don't like him because you know he speaks about the Quran in a certain way. But, um, uh, but what, one thing I really appreciate him like articulating for me, and that I always say to myself all the time is like, is this: um, no idea is above scrutiny, and no person is below dignity. And so another, uh, I, and so another adjacent idea to that is that like. It's not that there are a lot of bad people out in the world. You know, there's a lot of good people, but there's a lot, but many good people have just bad ideas that are just in them. Yes. And people are not their ideas. And, you know, I come from a certain community that grew up in, in, a, in this bubble of ideas about this certain man and this family and the magic powers and the, and the apostle and, and we're super special and the, world pop, the population of the world is in the billions, but we don't care within our own little within our own little group of just just a few thousand people or something like that. We're the special ones and we're better than everyone. I've never met anyone from Kazakhstan. I've never met anyone from India, blah, 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 who have their own religious ideas, but they're all wrong. Um, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I, I grew up around a lot of good people in that small little like uh, segment of Houston, uh, those few square miles of Houston and just bouncing about, just bouncing around all of it. I grew up around a lot of good people and and if anything, it's the it's 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 many of the church members that are themselves innocent and honorable, and they've just been taken up by this by these dumb ideas. And th that's what that's what people like me and other ex members are trying to do right now. It's just you know we recognize the the humanity within the people that we that we grew up in, and we're we just we just want them to get out. We just want them to recognize that hey, there are bad people out there, and this you've been injected with bad ideas for decades. Yeah. And we just want you to like get out of it and find something else for you so find something else for yourself. Um, people, you know, and some people will like uh, some, some people leave and they still believe in God and some people leave and they, they completely like abandon religious faith, like, like myself, but, uh, but, 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 but still like, nevertheless, like the priority number one is just getting this one set of bad ideas out of your head and just like, please just put yourself, just get out of the boat that's sinking and you know, at least swim in the water. You'll be, you know, you'll be fine in the water and you'll find your lifeboat. But like, like um, but yeah, that, that's what, that's what we're here to do. I, again, the quote is, um, no idea is above scrutiny and no person is below dignity. When we approach the, the ex-members, we, like, I, I treat them with their full dignity. Like I recognize they come from a certain background. They grew up around certain people hearing X amount of sermons every single, for hours, every single week. And it's just like, you know, we, you know, you're, you're, you're as much human as I was, and I'm sorry, but I wasn't as programmed as you. And I just want to rec I just want you to recognize within yourself that you've been programmed to some extent. I'm here to help you treating you with the dignity to help you recognize that the ideas that have been hammered into you are, are totally up for grabs uh, when it comes to uh, coming into the courtroom of like scrutiny, like just, uh, just like, like, please, like we, we can be better than this. Like we can just so be better than this um yeah, that's all i have to say thank you so much i totally agree with you i think um a lot of people get this stereotype from like um like jehovah's witness mormon la luz del mundo members that when they leave they're bitter and angry and they're mean and they hate the members 
And like, it's totally like, yeah, we are angry a lot of times, but, but we love the members and that's why we're so angry because we feel like they're being manipulated. They're being taken advantage of and they're being lied to. And it's so hard to watch that happen. It's so hard not to feel angry when that kind of thing is happening. And I think that it's one of those things that it's like, we just want them to realize because they are very good people. We want them to realize that not everything they're being told is the, you know, capital T truth. Um, you mm-hmm. know, like, for example, with Mormonism, like saying that, you know, homosexuality is not okay. You know, if you're gay, you can't get married, you can't have a relationship like that. And like, those kind of examples of, are like, I know all my Mormon friends like are kind, loving, good people. And they're just taught that that's just the truth, that God isn't okay with that. And running off of that framework causes them to do things that can be really hurtful to themselves especially if they are gay or whatever, um, but then also hurtful to other people and their friends and family, just because they think they're doing the right thing. So Mm -hmm. I love that we get to support this community because ultimately, ultimately we want people to realize that like, it's okay. Like you don't have to trust everything your religious um, group says is true because odds are it's not perfect. Like you think it is. Right. So Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. AJ, thank you so much for, thank you. you. Oh my God. Thank you so much for your time. We have done so, so much and there's still more to come. So click that subscribe button. Don't forget to check out AJ's channel. There's also going to be links in the description for resources. For those of you who might be a member or an ex member of La Luz del Mundo, we've got a, a subreddit for you. And there's also website to a really credible journalist. Um, And we're also going to be interviewing AJ about his personal story. So stick around. And then in the future, we'll have AJ back to talk more about this because there are so many similarities between these different um, groups that pop up. And I think it's so important that we learn so much about us as humans, as we dive in and learn about these religions and how the members are impacted and all of that. So All right, we will see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters who make this channel possible, and we'll see you guys later. Peace. Yes, awesome. Peace.